Bibles, please, and open to Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Luke 5, beginning in verse 1. The title of our message this morning is Becoming Disciples. Let's ask God's blessing and just receive from His Word. Father, thank you for the opportunity to receive now from your Word. We pray that you would just pour out your blessing on our lives because, Lord, we know that you use the Word of God in us by the power of the Holy Spirit to make us disciples, to transform us, to increase our faith, to understand more of who you are. And that is our prayer, that you would accomplish those things in us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Studying through the life of Jesus in Luke chapter 5, Jesus is just beginning his public ministry, and he's up in the north area there of the Sea of Galilee, and actually he's at the northern end of that, around the area of Capernaum is where he spent much of his time ministering. And the, the, the story begins that Jesus is teaching the multitude, and they are pressing all around him. So he's there at the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he sees two boats. And so he gets into one of them, happens to belong to Simon. We know him as Simon Peter. And he asks uh, Simon to put the boat out a bit from the shore, and uh, so he then sat down and began to teach the multitudes from the boat. And, of course, that would have accomplished a couple of things. First of all, it would have created some distance so he could then address the whole multitude. But secondly, the water becomes a natural amplifier. And so it is a, a, a really a, a perfect scene for teaching the Word of God. And you can just sort of step back and, and, and imagine this scene. What, what a powerful moment as the Son of God is teaching this crowd about the heart of God. But all of that is background to what then happens next. Because the real point of the story is what then happens between Jesus and Simon. For he is going to show Simon what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Let's read the story and we'll go back to it. Luke chapter 5 verse 1. I'm just going to read through the story and then we'll come back and look at it in parts. It came about that while the multitude were pressing around him and listening to the word of God, that he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. That's another name for the Sea of Galilee. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. Because in those days in the Sea of Galilee area, uh, they would fish with nets and they would fish at night. And so they have already been fishing all night. They're done. Uh, it's the daytime now. They're out there washing their nets, probably, uh, you know, ankle deep or knee deep in the water, just kind of washing their nets. And so this is the scene. And uh, verse 3, he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And uh, he sat down and he began teaching the multitudes from the boat. Now, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. And, and Simon answered and said, uh, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, at your bidding, I will let down the nets. You can kind of imagine the scene here. I mean, Simon is the expert fisherman. And after all, he has already been at this hard, he says, all night. Which is to say... Uh, sir, we have already been fishing all night, and we've been fishing hard all night, and I can tell you there are no fish there. And so that's the kind of the scene, and he tells them, put out the, the nets. It's the middle of the day. That's not when you catch fish. And, and I know this, because when we would take our kids uh, camping, we loved to go down to o Odell Lake. For several years, I used to take them camping at these various lakes and never catch anything. But I did some research, and I realized you're supposed to actually be able to catch fish there. So I, I would go down to the, you know, with the kids at Lake Odell, and, and uh, the, the, the problem was, apparently, uh, it was when we were actually fishing. Because we would get up, you know, whenever we felt like getting up, and we'd make a fire, and then we'd start a breakfast, and cook the bacon over the fire, you know, and made some coffee and hot chocolate for the kids, and we get all nice and toasty warm, and then we headed to the lake. And the problem was, we're heading to the lake, and all the fishermen are coming in. And so finally, I talked, uh, talked to one of the, the guys fishing, and I said, okay, how, how do you catch fish in this lake? Because we're not doing so well. And he said, man, you've got to get up at, oh, dark, 30. And, and catch the fish then. So I taught my kids some lessons about getting up at O dark 30. 
and we got some fish, but at least we ate dinner. Anyway, so I know this is the point that Simon is telling them, Lord, we have been at this all night. There are no fish there. And here's the point of the story, what follows next. Verse 5, however, or nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Now, when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets even began to break, so great was the quantity, and they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them, and they came and they filled both of the boats, even to the point that they began to sink. Now, when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, he immediately recognized something amazing is happening here. This is an amazing man. An amazement seized him. He fell down at Jesus' feet, verse 8, and he said, Depart, and this is his reaction, Depart, which is to say, leave. Separate yourself from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also James and John... Sons of Zebedee, we know them as the sons of thunder, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. I'll make you a fisher of men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything behind, and they followed him. What a great story. There's so much in this for us to learn. There's so much for us to understand because this is Jesus showing Simon what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And frankly, there's where we are in the story because that's God's heart after us as well, that we would understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Well, before we look at this in parts, again, I want us to kind of step back and look at, uh, at a bigger picture for a moment. For example, we really need to understand what does it mean to be a disciple. In those days, they had an understanding of it for it was a common thing to have a teacher and that teacher would have disciples. Now, at the root of the word disciple uh, is the idea of a teacher giving instruction. But it's much uh, deeper than just simply uh, taking a class. No, in those days, if you were a disciple... That meant that you would follow after the teacher. And in those days, you actually would live where the teacher lived. In other words, you would follow after the life of the teacher. And you would become like him. Because you are learning from him, you would become like him in character and thought and word and decisions and manner of living. See, to find a, uh, find a teacher in those days meant that you're learning how to live your life. Now, see, you can take classes today at, let's say, Portland State or uh, uh, the community college or whatever, and you can take classes to learn how to have a career. But how do you learn how to have a life? And that's the whole point. Jesus is going to teach them about life, how to live your life, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's the key to the understanding here. Because, you see, many people desire, of course, to be a Christian because they desire to have their sins forgiven and they desire to have eternal hope. But there is so much more than that in God's heart. See, not only does God want you to have your sins forgiven and your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, He wants the wisdom of Jesus to be your wisdom. He wants the character of Jesus to be your character. Uh, God wants his manner of life to be your manner of life. That's what it means to be a disciple. And that is the heart of God after us. It's how we live. And there is a great point here for all of us to understand because we understand God's heart after us. Now, another thing that we should also understand as we look at the big picture here is that God delights in using the unlikely people. It gives God great glory to use unlikely ones. I mean, take a look at this part of the story. Uh, at the end of this, he's going to receive four disciples that are fishermen. I mean, how unlikely is that? Can you imagine for a moment turning the world upside down with fishermen? I mean, all you've got to do is go down to the marina and talk to those who... Fish professionally, and then imagine yourself answering the question, can you take people like this and turn the world upside down? How unlikely is that? That's the point of the story. And now, in fact, later on in this chapter, 
he is going to ask a tax gatherer, a tax collector, hated and despised by all, well, except for other tax gatherers, hated and despised by all, he's going to take a tax gatherer and, and, and turn the world upside down? How unlikely is that? Now go to the other extreme, and you look at Saul, whom we know as Paul, and here you have this legalistic, religious Jew trained in the highest universities, but a vehement hater of Christians. He was such a hater of Christians that he was violent with it. I mean, he'd take, he had orders and, and authority. He would go take and drag them out of their homes. And, and it was a violent persecution. You're going to take a man like that? You're going to take a man like that and turn the world upside down? How unlikely is that? Now, here's the whole point. We need to look at ourselves. Who are you? Are you simple? Are you unsophisticated? Good. You're just the ones that God's looking for. And that's the point. Here's some great scriptures. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now, as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed. And they began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. Uh, I love that verse. Because you can put yourself in the, in the same verse. Would you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1? Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we have some verses that describe this point. I, I don't think there are better verses than these to make this point absolutely clear for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, let's begin in verse 25. Notice what it says. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. God has chosen the base things of the world and the despised things God has chosen, the things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are, that no man should boast before God. Uh, you look at those verses, and I don't know about you, but I find them very, very encouraging because I, I can easily look at my life and put myself right into that. Lord, the simple things, the base things, the weak things, oh, praise God, that means I'm useful to the Lord. I don't know about you, I find that greatly encouraging. And so now back to our story in Luke chapter 5. I want us to go over this and really understand what Jesus is trying to demonstrate to Simon because it's a lesson for all of us to receive. And as you look at this story, here's one of the points that jumped right out to us, and it's this, that disciples of Jesus Christ respond to God's word. Remember this part of the story, after Jesus had finished uh, um, teaching the multitude, he said to Simon, put out the boat into the deep and let down your nets. Now, Simon was the expert here, and he knew that this was an exercise in futility. I have already done this. I have already done this all night, and I have worked hard at this. Nevertheless, and there's the point, nevertheless, that's the key to the phrase, at your word, I will do it. And there's the point. A disciple understands this because it's a key to discipleship. Nevertheless, I will do what you ask. There it is. This is such a practical applica uh, application for us because we are so independent-minded. Now, come on. Isn't that true? We are independent-minded. Many people love the idea of being master of their own destiny. Doesn't that sound like something, something desirable? Master of your own destiny. The problem is that is a very dangerous proposition. Many people, when they hear God giving them a direction, they'll argue. In fact, when you look at, at uh, Simon, at first he seems to argue with the Lord. Sir, uh, we have already done this. We've done this all night. And I, and I love that response because it is so typical. I cannot tell you how many people 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to them and, and t telling them about the principles of the Lord. I cannot tell you how many people have said, I did that. I, I, I tried that. But see, Jesus is trying to demonstrate the significance of his presence and his power in it. doesn't matter whether you tried it or not. We're talking about what God's going to do. And that's the point of the story. And so, you know, you look at this, and uh, you see Simon arguing with God. I did that. I tried that. I did that all night long. I tried it hard. There are no fish there. Now, I think many people, they, they would kind of dismiss out of hand. As soon as they find an objection, they dismiss out of hand. I've done that. I've tried that. There are no fish there. End of the discussion. Case closed. But see, I love Peter's response. See, what Jesus was asking Simon to do surely did not make good fishing sense. We understand that. It did not make good fishing sense. But what he was asking him to do was to abide by his word. As a matter of faith, there's the point. A disciple of Jesus Christ must be willing to attempt even the impossible. When God is in it, you never know. When God is in it, you don't know. Anything can happen. This is what I've seen. Many people will quit at the first sign of an obstacle. But see, what we need to understand is that, hey, if God is in it, you don't know. Anything can happen. Do not dismiss the power of God. Do not underestimate the power of God in it. And in fact, there's a great scripture, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now unto him, this is so good, now unto him who is able to do far more abundantly, far more abundantly, beyond... <laughs> What a combination of words. Far more abundantly beyond all that we could ask or even think according to the power. Not our power. God's presence in it. That's the point that Simon needs to understand. It's God in it. According to the power that works within us. Simon argued at first, but then those famous words, but nevertheless, at your word, at your bidding, I will do it. I'll do it. If you're asking me to do it, I'll do it. And there you've got to see the example of what it means here. A disciple is being defined. It's, it's a glorious thing. But then you see the results of it. This amazing, great quantity of fish. And here's the whole point. God blesses faithfulness. Now, you might have seen that before, because that is a constant theme that runs through the Bible. A disciple of Jesus Christ needs to know that principle backwards and forwards. You need to have it written on our hearts. We need to have it memorized backwards and forwards. God blesses faithfulness, because it works in reverse also. Faithfulness blesses God. And so there we need to understand, you see, hey, it's easy to argue with God. God, I tried that. I did that. I tried that. See, when you say, I tried that, what you're saying is, I tried that on my own. I tried that on my effort. And when then God says, no, I'm asking you to do it, and now you're going to see my power in it. Oh, that's a whole other thing. Oh, that's a whole other thing. Nevertheless, at your word. Now, that's allegiance. That's faithfulness. That's faithfulness from the heart. Now, that takes trust, doesn't it? That takes trust. Would you do it if God asked you to do it? That takes trust that God knows what he's doing. In other words, we have to be willing to let the Lord be Lord. There's a famous uh, verse. This is Jesus speaking. This is uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 46. And this is Jesus speaking. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord? See, that was the expression of the day. Lord, Lord. When you say it that way, you, you, you are appealing to Lord, Lord. Why do you say Lord, Lord? but you do not do what I say. That does not make sense. That does not compute. Why do you say, Lord, Lord, and then you won't do what I say? You know what follows right after that? The very next words in Luke chapter 6, Jesus says, I will tell you that a man who listens to my words and lives according to them, he is like a wise man. 
He's like a wise man who builds his life on a strong foundation. He builds a house on a strong foundation. For when the storm comes and the wind and the rain beat against that house, it will not fall. But a foolish man builds his house on the sand. And when the storms come and the wind and the rain beat against that house, oh, how great will be its fall. Now, what a great word for us to understand. Call him Lord, 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 and trust him. But in order to call him Lord, Lord, it really does require a couple of things. First of all, it requires humility. Now, the reason why it requires humility is because we tend to be, again, so independent-minded people. But it also takes faith, doesn't it? It takes faith that God knows what he is doing. See, when you look at it from Simon's perspective, fishing logic does not help him here. Fishing sense doesn't help him here to understand why. Why was it that Jesus wanted him to put out that net? To instruct him in a new fishing technique? No, not at all. But logic didn't help him. Fishing sense didn't help him to understand why. But now we step back. And we look at it from a different perspective and we see that Jesus was teaching Simon about faith and about the power of trusting God's presence in your life. Trusting that he is right when he makes the call. This reminds me of a story. Many of you are perhaps old enough to remember when the Dallas Cowboys were actually a good football team. Many years ago, perhaps many decades ago, there was uh, a day when the Dallas Cowboys drafted a very good quarterback named Roger Staubach. Roger Staubach was mature and uh, old for his age and a very, very highly sought after quarterback. And, uh, but here is the problem. Roger Staubach called all the plays. He was considered a very excellent playmaker. And so as a quarterback, he would run his team. And he would call all the plays from his position at quarterback. The problem is that he got drafted onto the Dallas Cowboys team that was coached by Tom Landry. Now Tom Landry, in the minds of many, was considered a playmaking genius. The strategy on the field of Tom Landry was, was famous. So here comes Roger Staubach drafted onto Tom Landry's team. You can imagine now what's going to happen. Tom Landry, uh, excuse me, Roger Staubach later reported and said, I didn't like it. I, I, I resisted it, and I resented it. He would call in every play. He would, he would call in every single play. And he said, my, my attitude struggled. I resisted and I resented it. And I would not execute well. The result, they didn't do well. But he said, an interesting thing happened. I began to see that those calls that he was sending in were actually good. Once I set myself aside, I began to see that those calls were actually good. And I then began to execute those calls with all of my heart. The result, they won the Super Bowl in the next year. Here's the point of the story. The point of the story is that many people have an attitude of their heart which says, I'm the quarterback here. I call the plays of my life. No one calls plays for me. That has dangerous consequences. But when we understand God's word is right, God sends in plays that are good. The principles, the wisdom, the, the steps are ordered of God. Oh, the blessing that follows. That is the whole point. That's what it means to be a disciple. Jesus is giving Simon here a prophetic insight into even his own future. For at the word that Simon spoke of the word of God, thousands came. Talk about fisher of men, even to the point of breaking the nets. At one sermon, 3,000 came to the Lord. Amazing. Now, let's go back and look at the story from this perspective. And that is that Simon really didn't want to do it. 
I mean, you look at Simon's desire, he didn't really want to do it. It didn't make logical sense, for therefore he didn't want to do it. Uh, Peter, Simon, put down the nets into the deep. You can imagine Simon's first response. Well, we saw Simon's first response. Sir, <laughs> I have done this all night long, and I worked hard. I don't really want to do this. But, nevertheless, I'll do it. And here's the point that a, a disciple of Jesus Christ needs to, therefore, master his own desires. I don't really want to do this. But a disciple understands that we must master our own desires. For there are things that God is asking you to do that you don't want to do. I don't really, you know, it's very uncomfortable for me to pray with my spouse. It's a very uncomfortable thing. Would you do it if God asked you to do it? I really, you know, I, I'm, I'm just not really into praying with my kids or, or talking. To them, but would you do it if God asked you to do it? And then there are other things that we want to do. I really want to do this. And then God is saying, no, I really don't want you doing that. Because if you do that thing, it's really not going to end well. And I don't want you doing it. Would you then do it if, or not do it if God asked you to do it or not to do it? See, there is the point of what it means to be a disciple. I'll follow after you, Lord. Imagine what God would do in a life of a disciple that is responsive to his word. Oh, there are so many wondrous understanding scriptures that give us great insight into the effectiveness of obedience. Let's look at some scriptures. 1 Corinthians 9.27, this is Paul. He says, I discipline my body and make it my slave. In other words, I will not be mastered by the desires of my body. And we all, I think, all understand what that means. I will not be mastered. They are not going to give command to me. Paul wrote in another place, I will not be mastered by anything. I discipline my body. Discipline. There's that same word, discipline. I, I train it. I give it direction. I discipline my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself might not be disqualified. 2 Corinthians 10.5 We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. He's even saying, even to the point of the thoughts that come into your mind, an obedience of, of, of even your thoughts that come in your mind, he says, stick hold of them, seize hold of them, arrest them. If they're not right, They'll bring about much damage and destruction. Take hold of them. He's, it's a great word, isn't it? Uh, Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. Solid food is for the mature, in contrast to milk, which is for babies. Solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. A disciple of Jesus Christ understands the significance of the Word of God, and then will use the Word of God in his life, writing that Word of God upon his soul, so that he even then has the discernment. It's the result of it, the discernment of good and evil. Last scripture, Hebrews 4.12, for the Word of God, here it is, is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as a division of soul and spirit, I love this part here, and able to judge the very thoughts and the intentions of the heart. I don't know about you, but that is powerful. To understand what he is saying here, a disciple is a master of his own desires into the obedience of what God desires. I, I have a, a, I remember reading about how they used to train Arabian war horses. I love reading history. You can learn a lot from history. And I remember reading about how they used to train Arabian war horses. I don't know if you've ever been near an Arabian horse. I mean, an Arabian horse is a powerful animal. He's got chest muscles that ripple, you know. He's a powerful. Oh, they're just huge animals. Can you imagine having Arabian horses as a war horse? I mean, that is a powerful instrument of war. But if you get a powerful animal, it better respond to direction. And so they would take these Arabian war, war horses and they would put them through all the normal training regiment things that you would expect. 
And of course, the whole intent is to get this powerful horse to respond to the slightest direction. But there is one final test at the end to know if this horse is truly a war horse. What they would do is this. They would take the horses and put them uh, in a pen, a corral. And they would deprive them of water. Now, at first, you would say, that's a rather cruel thing. But this is actually a very important training for a war horse because in times of war, water is not always convenient. And so they would hold these uh, horses in this pen and deprive them of water many days. But they could see the water, they could smell the water, and they desired the water. Now, when they, they were then ready, what they would do is open the gates. Now, what would happen next is predictable. As soon as they would open the gates, these Arabian war horses would make a charge after the water. And they would, the instructors, the trainers, would step back and let them charge. And they would charge after the water. But then as they got near, they gave the command, Halt! And some of them would dig their hooves into, their, into the sand and come to a halt immediately. Others not hearing the instruction of the commander, or pretending not to, would charge into the water, and they were dismissed. But those who had come to a screeching halt were then given the command, come. And they would come to the commander, quivering and weak, but obedient. And now you have a war horse. Can you imagine the life can you imagine the effectiveness of the life that says, yes, Lord. I don't really want to. I don't even understand why. But nevertheless, at your word, I will do what you command. That's a powerful understanding. Now, let's go back to Luke 5. For there's another thing that we need to see, and it has to do with Peter's response. For when Jesus gave that command, and Peter said, nevertheless, and then he did it, the result was a great quantity, a great quantity of fish. Now, amazement struck Simon, and he fell down at his feet, and he said these words, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. And it has to do with Simon's understanding of who he is. Who are you, Simon? At that moment, it struck him. He's the Lord, and I'm sinful. And so he brings it out. See, here's the point. We're going to learn something very important and valuable for all of us. Disciples of Christ, disciples of Jesus, know who they are. First of all, when we look at these words, we should understand that Simon was still quite immature in his faith. And Simon's words here are a response of spiritual immaturity. Though we can certainly understand his reaction, this is actually a very common reaction that people have when they first encounter the Lord. When people's eyes are first opened to the Lord, the common reaction is, I am a sinner. Very common reaction. We can completely understand it. My life is messed up, Lord. You, you surely don't want to. And some people will even withdraw themselves. I'm messed up. I surely the Lord doesn't want to be near to me. And so they, they withdraw themselves. It's a common reaction. You can even see that reaction in, in, in the worldly sense when people are flipping the channel and on comes a, a religious pastor or a, a pastor giving a Christian message from the Word of God. Turn the channel, turn the channel, turn the channel. I don't like that stuff. But here is a great understanding, a very deep understanding. Know who you are. Who are you? A disciple of Jesus understands who you are in Christ. There's the point. Know who you are in Christ. For we are now hidden in Christ. Are you, are you a, do you have sin in your life? Well, of course, everyone has sin in his life. Of course, everyone has sin in his life. But if we would have the perspective that we are in Christ, my life is hidden in him. My future, my eternity it's hidden in Him. Everything is found in Him, and I am now in Him. It would cause us to have a very different reaction. If we would understand that I am safe in Christ, then our reaction would be, instead of, depart from me, Lord, our reaction would be quite opposite. Depart from me, sin. I am in the presence of the Lord. Get away from me, sin. I am in the presence of the Lord. This attitude is a major shift of the heart. 
And it comes from understanding and knowing who we are in Christ. Who are we? If, if you are identifying yourself with your sin, then God has some insight for you. Some would say, well, I am. You want to know who I am? I'm a liar. That's what I am. I'm an adulterer. That's what I am. I'm a sinner. That's for sure. You know, the, the, the enemy is called the accuser of the brethren. How apt. Accuser of the brethren. He wants to remind you of the things you've done, the sins that have been in your life, the problems you've had. Here's the problem. The problem with this is that it's true. And therefore, because it's true, see, on this matter, he doesn't need to lie. The problem is, because it's true, we don't know how to give an answer. How do you give an answer when it's true? The problem is that it's only partly true. There's still more yet to say about this. And that's the insight that God wants us to have. When we are in Christ, we have a change of perspective about who we are. We know how to give an answer. Turn in your Bibles, would you, to Romans chapter 6. Oh, Romans chapter 6 is such an important chapter. If we could only understand the significance of it, I tell you, it would transform our lives. Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, is a deep understanding. It's a wonderful understanding. I tell you, people, we are only scratching the surface of what Romans chapter 6 means. Listen to these words. What shall we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace might actually increase? Oh, God forbid it. May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Have you died? Well, you look like you're all breathing here. Have you died? He's going to give us a very deep spiritual understanding. Verse 3. Do you not know, which is to say we ought to know, that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. We are in Christ. Therefore, we've been baptized into his death. Therefore, we've also been buried with him through baptism into death. Speaking about by the Spirit here, by the way. In order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly also we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, and our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of it. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we could grasp that, we have grasped something marvelous. For it tells us who we are. We're not who we used to be. We're in Christ. Our eternity is found in Him. Our hope is found in Him. Our forgiveness is found in Him. Our life is found in Him. Oh, that is something we need to absolutely understand. May we know this. May we stand firm in this truth to know who we are in Christ. Then we would say, as Simon, not as Simon who was young in faith, but there's a maturity of faith by which we would say, get away from me, sin. I am in Christ. There it is. Go back to Luke 5. We're going to end with this. Notice then what happens. He falls down and he makes that statement. But Jesus then responded in verse 10 and said, Don't fear, Simon. I will make you a fisher of men. You know what I love about that perspective is that God takes who he was and using that in who he will become. You were a fisherman? I'm going to make you a fisher of men. Kind of reminds us of David who was a shepherd. And, and here was David, a lowly, humble shepherd, and God came to David, essentially, and said, you were a shepherd, I'm going to make you a shepherd of men. It's a beautiful understanding that God does not waste our life, you might say. He takes who you were and, and makes it a part of who you will be. I think about that for my life because I see that also. My first job, my first real job, other than picking berries, because when I grew up, we worked. But after picking berries, my first job was being a janitor. Now, who knew that as a pastor, those are some skills that are going to come in handy? A pastor needs to know how to clean the bathrooms and to mop the floors. Another job that I had was uh, managing a kitchen. I was a kitchen manager. 
Well, who knew? As a pastor, we would be making food a big part of what we do here at Calvary Chapel. Who knew? Another thing I did was wait on tables. You know, Howard Hendricks, famous uh, professor at Dallas Theological Seminary, said one time, waiting tables is excellent preparation for the ministry. For you have to learn how to serve. And that's the heart of what God wants in those that he would use to lead his people. And I think back, even when I was at Oregon State, fine university that it was, I went to Oregon State, you're going to be shocked at this, but I actually started out as a pre-med major. The problem with pre-med major, as I discovered it, is that you actually have to study. <laughs> and that I did not do very well. Because I was away from home, I was away from my accountability, and didn't work so well. But I took some lessons, I took some classes in the piano. They actually offered piano class for my electives. I took piano. And I, I just loved that. In fact, I ended up spending hours and hours and hours playing the piano. Now, according to those paying my way to school, that wasn't a very good use of judgment there. But who knew? that actually playing the piano was going to become a very relevant part of my life as a pastor, much more so than biochemistry. Who would have guessed? But see, there's the point. God uses who we were to make us who he will cause us to be. Now, going back to the story, and we'll finish with this. Notice what follows next, because then it says, verse 11, that they had brought their boats to land, and they left everything behind. And there is a great lesson. Part of understanding what it means to be a disciple. Leave the old behind. They left everything. See, these men are becoming disciples of Jesus Christ. Here, here's the point. There is a point at which maturity sets in. And it is seen when we leave the old behind. Please hear this. There is a point by which spiritual maturity begins to set in. When maturity sets in, you can see it because there's a leaving of the old. Now, some people can leave the old behind in one fell wondrous renewing. Others, it's more of a step-by-step. -step. That would be more like me. I'm more of a step-by-step -step transformed person. Still, God is in the process of transforming all of us. But I think back, for example, about some of the old stuff. A disciple leaves the old behind. Some people carry the old around with them in a gunny sack. Get tired of carrying that old stuff. And one by one, they take it out. Get rid of it. For me, it was music. When I was young, oh, did I love music. And a lot of young people are into music, but I was into really worldly music, raunchy music. Oh, I just, uh, it was something, you know, I can name the bands, but I, I don't want to give them any more fame. But I was a Christian. Went to church. And if somebody would have came to me and said, you need to get rid of that stuff, I would have said, you know what, I'm fine. I'm good, thank you. But an interesting thing happened. Somebody gave me uh, a cassette. Not an A-track. A cassette. I put it in my car. Something marvelous. I started listening to this music. Over and over. And I would sit in my car and I would play it loud. I like music loud. And I would turn it up. And I just, something was happening in me. It was igniting my soul. Something that none of that music had been able to do. It was igniting something inside of my soul. And I'll never forget this one day, I was sitting there listening to the song, I was just sitting there, I wasn't driving, I was just sitting in my car, music was very loud, and I was listening to the song over and over, and I started crying. It was, it was a crying of joy, it's like the, the beauty of the Lord was overwhelming me. And I began to understand something, my soul is being ignited here. And the things of the world in music began to grow strangely dim.
this is what God wants to show us, that a disciple following after Jesus leaves the old behind. The great scripture will end with this. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If anyone is in Christ, there it is. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things passed away, old things. Behold, new things have come. New things will come. New things that will ignite your soul. New things. God is doing new things. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for doing new things in us, for igniting our soul. Thank you for showing us in these verses what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And Lord, when we see that description, our heart is ignited by it. And we desire it. Lord, do that in us. Do that in us, God. We want to see the igniting of our soul as well. Is that your heart in prayer? Would you even raise your hand and say, that's my prayer right there. I say yes and amen. Oh God, would you do this in my life? Just raise your hand even in, in, in confidence, saying, Lord, this is my prayer. Do this in me. Do this in me, God. Oh, Father, we are so thankful for your heart after us. Oh, if we could only understand the life, the change, the transformation, the significance of your power in us. Oh, help us, Lord. Help us to see it. Help us to open our eyes. Help us to open our hearts. Help us to desire those things that you desire. We honor you and thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, and everyone said...